joke, I joke. Um, We are jumping into a brand new sermon series um, in the uh, book of Judges. Uh, Judges is an Old Testament book. Um, Just by show of hands, did anyone read it uh, or have read it before uh, in in its entirety, right? So from chapter one, okay, great. Okay, there's a few few of you. Um, How many of you have studied it, like actually done an in-depth study um, on the book of Judges? Okay, wow, no pressure. Uh, I'll make sure that uh, what I have here is legit. In fact, you can actually make sure that what we're doing um, is, is legit. Because the, the book of Judges is one of those books, uh, where I'm going to be honest here, uh, it's one of those books uh, where I find, I find it tremendously uncomfortable. Um, it's one of those books where if it was the only book uh, in the Bible, I, I would want nothing to do with God. I really wouldn't. Um, because it, it makes no sense to me how God would allow uh, the things that happen in the book of Judges. But praise Jesus that it's not the only book in the Old Testament or the New Testament. Um, and so it allows us to look at it, uh, not in, in its isolation, but to look at it in its entirety, in the whole narrative of the Bible, what God is communicating to us. And so we're going to be in this book uh, for the next couple of weeks. Um, and my hope is that we would learn something. Um, in fact, not just something, but we'd learn a whole lot, uh, that God has something for us. He's communicating something to us, uh, that we would see much of God, who He is, and that we would understand who we are in light of that. The subtitle to this sermon series uh, is Hope uh, for the Horrific, uh, because there are a lot of horrific things that happen in this book. Uh, but here's the thing. I don't think much has changed since the days of Judges, uh, that we don't have to go too far to recognize that we live in horrific times, that horrendous things are happening day after day after day after day. And so the question is, can we find hope in these horrific times? Could they find hope in their horrific times? I'll go ahead and tell you the answer is yes, all right? Uh, No secrets here. Yes. Uh, that it's in God that we find our hope, even in the most horrendous of times. And so we're going to jump straight in. Um, We're going to look at the first two chapters uh, today. Uh, And one last thing before I pray and then we uh, get into the text is I I don't want us to think of what's going on in the book of Judges as mere stories. And what I mean by that is where we think of them as kind of fictional events, uh, that, that they're like fairy tales, like God's using some, some illustrations here to make a point. No, these are true events. They really happened. They really happened. And so I want us to, to come to the text that way. Because I think only then, only then will we be able to look at what was going on there and then look at what's going on now and see that God is still seated on his throne, fully in control, and he has a plan for us. And so if you have your Bible, uh, you can meet me in Judges chapter 1. I'm going to pray, and then we'll get to work. Father, thank you for your word. I pray that you would make it plain to us this morning, that you would speak through me, that I would be an instrument in your hands. Open up our hearts, God. We want to see you for who you are, recognizing that we are loved more than we could ever imagine because of the finished work of Jesus. And so this time is yours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Judges chapter 1, verse 1. It says, after the death of Joshua, all right, so let me give a little context to what's going on here. Um, so the, the people of God, the Israelites, ha- had been uh, under Pharaoh's oppression for 400 years. 
Uh, they've been in Egypt for 400 years as slaves. And then God raises up Moses and says, I want you to go and tell Pharaoh to let my people go because I want to take my people to the promised land, uh, a land uh, that is flowing with milk and honey. It's a land that I have promised them. And so I want you to go to Pharaoh and say that his people, God's people are now being liberated and are now heading towards the promised land. And so that's what happens. Under Moses' leadership, uh, they make their way to the promised land, but things don't go well, and so they end up wandering around the wilderness for 40 years. But in that, uh, the law comes up. Uh, that's where uh, the institution of the priestly order happens as well. That's all under Moses, and then Moses dies. Then Joshua takes over. It's Joshua who then leads God's people into the promised land, but now there are people that live there, evil people, and God goes, listen, uh, this wasn't going to be a simple kind of walk in that you've got to go in and conquer, but I have promised this land to you, and so under Joshua's leadership, they go into the land, they conquer it, Um, also under Joshua's leadership, uh, the establishment of the 12 tribes of Israel, we see that as well, and they get portions of the land, Uh, and then Joshua does. Enter Judges. You see, it's in Judges that the people of God are now beginning to occupy this land. But there are still some places that still need to be conquered. All right? There's still some places that need to be conquered. After the death of Joshua, the Israelites inquired of the Lord, who will be the first to fight for us against the Canaanites? Now, at first glance, Uh, This looks like a genuine question. But later we will see that that they actually don't want the answer to that question. They actually don't. That this question has good intentions. But here's the thing about intentions. Look, they're really nice, right? Intentions are nice, but obedience is better. Obedience is better. Intentions are nice, but obedience is better. Intentions didn't save you. It's Jesus' obedience to the cross. Verse 2, the Lord answered, Judah is to go. I have handed the land over to him. Judah said to his brother Simeon, come with me to my allotted territory and let's fight against the Canaanites. I will also go with you to your allotted territory. So Simeon went with him. Now, now here, uh, Judah and Simeon, uh, they aren't individual people. These are the tribes. These tribes were named after individual people, the, the, the 12 sons of Jacob. Firstborn was Reuben, then Simeon, then Levi, this is where all the priests come from, Moses and Aaron, and then Judah. This is where David comes from. This is the line from which Jesus comes from. And so here he's referring to the tribes, but he's calling them by name. He says, he's, he, they, I've given it to Judah. And so what does Judah do? Judah goes to his brother Simeon and he says, why don't you come and help me? Now again, this seems like a good thing, but remember, that's not what God said. Judah, you, you go. Okay, hold on. Simeon, uh, will you come with me? The, the question maybe uh, this morning is, is there a Simeon in your life? God, God's spoken to you. He's called you. But, but maybe you've gone, oh, I don't, I don't. Let, let me go get Simeon. If we had time, I'd unpack more of that. Verse 4, when Judah attacked, the Lord handed, the Lord handed, the Lord handed the Canaanites and the Perizzites over to them. They struck down 10,000 men in Bezek. They found Adonai, which means Lord or King, uh, King Bezek in Bezek, fought against him and struck down the Canaanites and the Perizzites. Friends, the real reason Judah was successful was not because they had a good strategy. Uh, That is helpful. It's not because of military strength. Now, that's not a bad thing to have. But it's not because of amazing leadership. And and please, friends, uh, 
I hope that you always strive to be under good leadership. But it's none of those things. It's because God was with them. The Lord handed. They were under God's blessing. Verse 6, when Adonai Bezek fled, they pursued him, caught him, and cut off his thumbs and big toes. I guess that was just a thing. It's like, it's what we do. You know, we just, we're out here capturing people, cutting off thumbs and toes. But a closer look reveals that this wasn't torture. Because I know at first glance, it's like, wow, these people, God's people, oof, you don't want to end up in their hands, right? It, it looks like torture, but, it, but it's not. A closer look will reveal that this is judgment. God is using Israel as an instrument of judgment to the Canaanites for their evil. Even Bezek knows this. Read with me verse 7. It says, Adonai Bezek said, 70 kings with their thumbs and big toes cut off, used to pick up scraps under my table. He's saying, this is what I used to do. God has repaid me for what I have done. Even Bezek realizes that this, this is judgment now. But, but I know you might say, oh no, I, I thought we were meant to love our enemies. Matthew 5 verse 44. I thought that vengeance belongs to the Lord. So what are these guys doing? Well, remember, this is not revenge, this is judgment. And yes, we are called to love our enemies, but we must also remember when this is happening. This is Old Testament. Old Testament. And so what the Israelites are doing, they're going, we're an instrument of judgment, an instrument of justice. That what we are doing is wrapped up in the law of Moses. We're just being obedient to God's word. Leviticus chapter 24, verse 19 to 20 says this, anyone who injures another person must be dealt with according to the injury inflicted. A fracture for a fracture, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Whatever anyone does to injure, another person must be paid in kind. And so in this case, a thumb for a thumb. A toe for a toe. It, it's in these moments, it's in these moments that I am thankful for the cross. Oh, yeah. Amen. Hey? Let, let's be honest. I, I am thankful for the cross. Had it not been for the cross, there would be a lot of toothless, one-eyed, fractured people in here this morning. I'm just keeping it real. I mean, another question we could ask is, why couldn't God just sweep this under the rug? It's like, okay, okay, uh, King Bezek, I realize that you've done these horrendous things, uh, but let me just sweep this under the rug. Well, the reason God could not do that is because righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. He, he wouldn't be true to himself. God must apply justice, otherwise he wouldn't be God. I mean, what, what good is a judiciary if it doesn't apply justice? I mean, what's the point? He has to apply justice, but God, rich in mercy, applies the justice on his own son. Friends, that is the gospel that our fate was meant to be the same as King Bezek. And so God pours out his justice on Jesus. This is why we are thankful for the cross. And so they continue on their conquest, going from region to region, doing that which God has called them to do. And things look good. Things seem to be going to plan until verse 19, where we read, the Lord was with Judah and enabled them to take possession of the hill country. 
but they could not drive out the people who were living in the plain. This is the coastal plain. They could not drive out the people who were living in the plain because those people had iron chariots. Uh Uh-oh. So things are going according to plan, and then all of a sudden, we can't drive out these people. Why? Because they have iron chariots. But friends, if we've been following the Israelites' journey from Egypt until now, this should be a so what moment. So what moment. Iron chariots, so what? I mean, let's look a little bit at their journey. Pharaoh and his army, so what? God is with us. The Red Sea, so what? God is with us. The Amalekites attack, so what? God is with us. The walls of Jericho, so what? God is with us. And so what they had, iron chariots? God is with us. You see, this inability to drive out the people and take possession of the land is not just an issue here in verse 19. This comes up again in verse 27, and again in verse 29, and again in verse 30, and again in verse 31, and again in verse 32. This inability to drive out the people. And so it begs the question, what's going on here? Why all of a sudden? Why Things were going to plan, but now all of a sudden we can't drive out these people. So I believe Judges chapter 2 gives us the answer. And so jump with me to Judges chapter 2 verse 1. It says, the angel of the Lord. Now, let me pause here for a moment. I think it's important for us to understand who this is. Who is this angel of the Lord? He, he appears in Judges for the first time, but, but, but we, we, it's not the last time that we see this angel of the Lord. Uh, he comes up again in Judges chapter 5 verse 23, and then again in Judges chapter 6 verse 11, and then again in Judges chapter 13 verse 3. And so who is he? It's God. I believe it's, it's God. It's, 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 it's what uh, many have come to know as a theophany. A theophany. One word made of two. Theo, meaning God, and phony, meaning to show or to reveal. It's God revealing himself. And he does this so many times in the Old Testament where, where we, we read something, and it, it doesn't say God, it doesn't say the Lord, but, but if we study it further, we actually realize that it's God himself revealing himself to the situation, the theophany. But Oni, how do you know that's true? Well, if we continue to read... The angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I brought you out of Egypt and led you into the land I promised to your ancestors. I also said I will never break my covenant with you. It wasn't an angel that brought them out of the land of Egypt. It wasn't an angel that made a covenant with them. It was God. Scripture interprets Scripture. I think too often what we do is we we just don't read further enough. An angel of the Lord. It's God himself. It says, you are not to make a covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You are to tear down their altars, but you have not obeyed me. Remember, we're trying to figure out Why all of a sudden now we can't drive out these people? But you have not obeyed me. What have you done? God asks. What have you done? Friends, they did not complete the mission. You see, they were told by God to take possession of the land, to to drive out, to conquer, to to take complete authority over this land. And they did 
not complete the mission. If, if we go back to Judges chapter 1, we see that, that they took some of the people of the land as slaves. They just welcomed them in. They took them as forced labor. Judges chapter 1, verse 21, verse 24 to 26, verse 28, verse 29, 30, 32, 33, and 35 were told over and over and over and over again that they went in and then they took them as forced labor. That's not what God said. And permit me to off-ramp here a little bit. We'll get back uh, on our journey towards our destination. But let me off-ramp here a little bit and make the point that, that what we're seeing here is something that continues to happen time and time again. The, the Israelites, it wasn't too long ago that they themselves were forced labor. The, the pain of that the oppression. It wasn't too long ago. And yet here, we find them taking people and making them slaves. You see, if we don't deal with the injustices that have happened to us, we run the danger of repeating that which has happened to us onto the others. Let me say it another way. If we don't deal with the injustices that have occurred to us, we also run the danger of handing that very thing over to the next generation. When I talk to my Afrikaans brothers and sisters, they, they, they often tell me about the, 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 the pain and the injustice that their ancestors went through at the hand of the British. That they were placed in concentration camps. This led to the Anglo-Boer War, 1899 to 1903. And they won that war. And then it wasn't too long until they then put black and brown people into concentration camps in the form of spatial segregation. I'm not trying to be political. I'm just trying to make the point that if we do not deal with the injustices that have occurred to us or those who, have, who went before us, we run the danger of handing it over to the next generation. And this is a supernatural thing. Hashtags and really cool clothing and curriculum is not going to cut it. It requires supernatural forgiveness, supernatural reconciliation. It requires the gospel. And this is why we as the church must be at the forefront of this. We cannot hang back and just go, you know, I think the government will take care of it. I mean, they have a role to play. But friends, we, we have the, the gospel Get back on track. They did not complete the mission. God says, but you have not obeyed me. This brings us to my first point. A and it's a recurring theme in the book of Judges. And that is, partial disobedience leads to complete devastation. Partial disobedience leads to complete devastation. See, it all starts when we take our eyes off God and we begin to look at ourselves. They have iron chariots. The response should have been, we have God. But it didn't go like that. The conversation went like this. They have iron chariots. So what do we have? Why would you ask that now? What did you have when you, you stood and in front of you was the Red Sea, behind you was Pharaoh and his army? What did you have then? When you first went to war, remember these were slaves. 
What did you have then? So why now? Well, it's because I think we've become a little bit too confident in ourselves. We're seeing victory. We're seeing blessing. We take our eyes off God and we go, look at what we have done. And so when you come up against opposition that is bigger than you, and you've been living in a look at what I can do, now all of a sudden you're going, I, 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 I don't know if I can. Partial disobedience leads to complete devastation. It's not that they can't drive out the Canaanites. It's that they won't. And there is a massive difference between the two. It's not that they can't. It's that they won't. They won't be obedient. That's where it all begins. And look at God's response to their disobedience. On it, why do you say complete devastation? Verse 3, therefore I now say, I will not drive out these people before you. They will be thorns in your sides, and their gods will be a trap for you. Complete devastation. Maybe think of it this way. Think of your life as the promised land. What are the areas in your life that you're saying, God, I want? God, I want. He, he's told you what needs to happen, but, but you, I, I won't. Is it sex and relationships? Because he's, he's told us how that is supposed to play itself out, but, but you won't stop sleeping with the person who's not your spouse. You'll do all the other things. You'll show up to the gathering. You'll show up to your midweek gathering. You'll read your Bible. But in that area, I just won't. Maybe it's money. Maybe you just refuse to be generous. Maybe you just don't tithe. And I know some of you have been coming here for a while, and you might go, oh, that one again about money. You know, he's going he's gonna to call us to be generous. He's going to call us to give. Yo, Oni talks a lot about money. It's like he, he, talks, he only talks about money. No, no, I don't. I don't. Do I talk about money? Yes, I do. I talk a lot about money. There's a number of reasons why. Let me give you two. One, because Jesus talks a lot about money. And I just want to be obedient to Jesus. Now, look, if there's one thing that I'm going to be guilty of, like, it's fine. I'll be guilty of being obedient to Jesus. Jesus talks a lot about money. So should we. The, the, the other reason I, I talk a lot about money, because money is powerful. Money is powerful. It can be a powerful tool or a powerful idol. And my fear is that for most of us, it's more a powerful idol than a tool. Only how do you know? You use your generosity as a metrics of trying to figure that out. How generous are you? That usually will determine whether this is a powerful tool or a powerful idol. Some of you need to have a conversation with Jesus, the same one that Jesus had with the rich young ruler. Shows up and he's like, you know, how do I inherit the kingdom of God? Jesus tells him, well, you got to do this, got to do this, got to do this. Oh, I'm doing that. I read my Bible, I pray, I, like I'm killing it. Can I go sell everything that you have? Whoa, 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 whoa. Jesus, calm down. Is it unforgiveness? Are there people in our lives that we're, willing, we're not willing to let go of? There's so much anger and bitterness towards them that we're just we're unwilling to let go of them. God, we, we pretend in every other area of our lives, but in this one place, we're just we're unwilling. God says, forgive, and you go, I won't. 
And that won't, when you communicate it, you go, I can't. No, no. It's because you won't. And, and let me say this. I know, I know that, that, they, that even now when you're thinking about that person, you think, this, it's, you know, this is, it's impossible. I, I just, I don't know if I can. Again, this is why we need supernatural power. There's a reason we spend time in a series that we titled The Resurrected Life. You need resurrection power to forgive the people in your life that have harmed you, that have brought pain to you. It is not an easy thing. But you know who's the hardest person to forgive? Yourself. Some of you are carrying so much, so much guilt and shame because you, you can't forgive yourself. And yet God goes, I, I know everything about you. I know we keep secrets here. T two words that I absolutely cannot stand in the church is private and confidential. I don't see that anywhere in the Bible. I just don't. Private and confidential. That's a term that's used out there in, in, in legal contracts and, and, and all these other things that we sign. But in the Bible, there is no private and confidential. Yeah, but only there's people out there that are... No, I get that. I get that. That's called gossip. And we call people out for that. That folks should have enough wisdom and insight and, and, and they're leaning into the spirit that when someone comes and says something to you, you go, you know what, I need to recognize that this is something that I bring to the Lord. I come alongside you. I maybe share with people who can help you, but I'm not out there putting your information on blast. I get that. But when we go private and confidential, it's our way of hiding things in our lives. And some of that is the guilt and the shame that we carry. And so we pretend in front of people. You can't pretend in front of God. And guess what? He's forgiven you. And so, permit me to take this a step further. Guilt and shame where you don't want to forgive yourself. I, I can't. No, you won't. You won't lean into the presence of the Father. So you, you're essentially saying, I don't know if God can forgive me of this. Pride. Who do you think you are? That the blood of Jesus cannot cover you? Who are you? Community. Is this an area of your life that you just I'll do everything else, but the community thing, God, no, it's not for me. I don't see it in the Bible. Where is thus says, uh, be in community? No, you know what that is? That's you just being lazy because it is scattered everywhere. There's a reason that, that the people of God are called a family. But you just won't. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Are you flirting with someone who's not your spouse? Is that just an area of your life that you're just like, you know, uh, I'll do everything else but, but that. I just want to still have that in my life. What area of your life are you, hear these words, choosing, choosing to be disobedient? This thing of like, I fell into sin. How? I, no, I was on my phone and I went to the app where I know that I'm going to see things I shouldn't see, and then I saw them, and then I fell into sin. Okay, can we just change language here? You chose. You chose to be disobedient. And when you do that, you are opening up yourself to idolatry. You are opening yourself up to idolatry. Partial disobedience leads to complete devastation. And when we open up ourselves to idols just like they did, we become enslaved by these idols. Idol worship enslaves, friends. That's what it does. It enslaves. Read with me verse Four, 
When the angel of the Lord had spoken these words to all the Israelites, the people wept loudly. Look, I, I think there were some genuine people, and then I think there were some people that, that those tears were just crocodile tears. All right, crocodile tears. Like you, you, like you just know. Like parents in the room, you know. Like, like you're chilling, and then you hear uh, your kids playing outside, and then you hear one of them crying. You always go, no, which one is this one? Because there's one where you go, I'm dropping everything and I'm out there, I need, I, I need a help. And then there's one where you go, ah, it'll stop just now. <laughs> and then they get distracted and then it's gone. Like it was this cry, this like, oh my, like an alien, you know, like the birth of an alien. And, and, and then gone. And you're like, what just, what just, what just happened? I, I, I think among these people, there, there were those who, who were genuinely weeping over their sin conviction. And then there was a group of people that were kind of like, ah, I see everyone else is doing it. You know, it's like, it's like sometimes in worship, it's like, uh, I raise my hands, I raise my hands. You know what I mean? Like, so, so they wept, so, and then they, they, they offered sacrifices to the Lord, we see that in verse 5. Verse 6, previously when Joshua had sent the people away, the Israelites had gone to take possession of the land. Each to his own inheritance. The people worshiped the Lord throughout Joshua's lifetime and during the lifetime of the elders who outlived Joshua. They had seen all the Lord's great works he had done for Israel. Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. They buried him in the territory of his inheritance, in the Timnath Hez, in the country, hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gash. The whole generation was also gathered to their ancestors. Well, that whole generation was also gathered to their ancestors. After them, another generation rose up who did not know the Lord or the works he had done for Israel. Forgetfulness leads to unfaithfulness. And this should tell us that we are always only one generation away. Some people ask, Oni, why do you always repeat stuff? Why do you always say the same thing? Because we are forgetful people. Yeah. And forgetfulness leads to unfaithfulness. The Israelites did what was evil in the Lord's sight. They worshipped the Baals and abandoned the Lord, the God of their ancestors who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed other gods from the surrounding peoples and bowed down to them. They angered the Lord, for they abandoned him and worshipped Baal and Ashtoreths. The Lord's anger burned against Israel. And he handed them over to marauders. These are like plunderers. He handed them to the plunderers who raided them. He sold them to their enemies around them. And they could no longer resist their enemies. You went from being so incredibly powerful to no longer, like you just can't resist. Like there's nothing that you can do. Whenever the Israelites went out, the Lord was against them and brought disaster on them, just as he had promised and sworn to them, so they suffered greatly. Idol worship enslaves. That's what it does. You, you, you left Egypt liberated, you're now free, and now you find yourself worshiping idols, and you're back where it all began. Now, at first glance, this sounds harsh, God, this is, this, this is a little harsh. Why would, what, what, like, I don't know if I want to serve a God like that. Where is the God of love and mercy? Like this, this, I mean, he handed them over. He sold them. Ah, no, I don't know if I can worship a God like this. This seems harsh. But before you go there, may I make the point that God is giving them what they asked for. Uh, think about it for a moment. God is simply giving them what they asked for. This should make us think of the parable of the prodigal son. Or as Tim Keller likes to say, the prodigal of the loving father. 
I prefer that title. Many of us know this story. It's found in Luke chapter 15. It's a parable that Jesus tells about a father who had two sons. And one day, one of the sons, the younger one, goes up to the father and says, you know what, give me my inheritance. Now, look, I think the father, and I believe the father was a loving father, and so I don't think it was like, give me my inheritance, okay, cool, take it, go by. No, I think it was conversation, day after day, week after week. He was pleading with his son, why? Everything that you need is here, why? And he's like, no, no, give me my inheritance. What he's actually saying is, I wish you were dead. Because how else am I going to get my inheritance? I wish you were dead. And so, Father gives him what he asks for. See, see I, I hear this debate often. That yet we are not robots. We get to choose. Right? We're not robots. Like, like God, God is not sitting on his throne with a whip. He, he desires a relationship with his children. And, and so he pleads with us to press into that relationship. But when we go, no, I want what I want. He goes, okay, take it. And so the son uh, takes the inheritance. Uh, we're told that he squanders it through wild living. I mean, you can imagine what that is. And I know some of you are like, I don't even have to imagine wild living. Yep, that's yep, that my life is like that. Wild living. <laughs> he spends it all. I'm sure, like when it started, he had friends everywhere. And then when the money was gone, also the friends were gone. If, if you only have friends because you spend money, <laughs> they're not your friends. Yeah. Here's another one. This one's free. If, if you have friends and you can never find yourself saying no to them, they're not your friends. Yeah, and so this squanders it all, and then we're told that there was a great famine that made things even worse, and so now he has nothing. He's hungry, thirsty, he's probably cold. And so he, he, he then gives himself to, to this employment, let's call it that for now, employment um, as one who feeds pigs. Now, again, you've got you've to put yourself in that context. This, this, as a Jewish person, this was just like, this was a no-no. A no-no. Because of what Moses had written in Leviticus. Just stay away from pigs. They are disgusting. And yet he's, he's so desperate. So desperate, he's like, it's fine, I'll do it. I'll, I'll, I'll feed the pigs. I really sometimes think, you know, when Jesus would tell some of these parables, I think the disciples would be like, you know, it's like, this is a great story, this is a great story. Yeah, tell them, Jesus, tell them. Whoa, Jesus, whoa, 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 stop. Stop, Jesus, could you stop with the pigs? I thought we're trying to build a movement, but when you talk like this, when you make the Samaritan the hero of the story, it's not good for us. I think Jesus would go, yeah, I am building a movement, just not the movement that you think. And so he's among the pigs. The pigs. In fact, the, the story tells us that, that he began to look at the food that the pigs were eating and was like, man. I, verse 17 of Luke chapter 15 tells us that he then came to his senses. He came to his senses and went, you know what? In my father's house, there are servants who eat way better. Maybe I should go back and just ask my father if I could just be a servant. Some of us, we need to have people around us who pray that we come to our senses. Because right now, you, you're among the pigs. Would you come to your senses? God is simply giving them what they wanted. It's like, a child who goes to their parents and goes, I want to be emancipated. They go, no, I don't think that's a good idea. No, I want to be emancipated. I want to live on my own. I don't want to live here anymore. And then the parents go, okay. And then when the honeymoon ends, when you run out of money and you realize, oh, wow, I got to wake up in the morning and go work. Do 
the prodigal son tells us that when you're in this place, you can still come home. You can still come home. And so even this morning, there are prodigal sons and daughters here, like, come home. Jesus wraps up the story by saying, as the son is on his way home, he's probably mumbling to himself, trying to figure out, how am I going to tell the story? What can I say? How low can I put myself so that my father would allow me back into the home? The father sees him and bolts for him. Wraps his arms around him. Yells out and says, my son is home. The feast must begin. Come home. There's no amount of guilt or shame that the blood of Jesus cannot cover. Come home. Idol worship enslaves. And we will see this throughout the book of Judges. But what we will also see is that even though idol worship enslaves, God's merciful hand saves. God's merciful hand saves. Uh, read with me verse 16. The Lord raised up judges. I love the fact that it says the Lord raised up judges, that they didn't self-appoint themselves. There wasn't a subcommittee that was like, you know, it's a really good idea. I think we should raise up judges. No, they would have never done that. The Lord raised up judges who saved them from the power of their marauders. But they did not listen to their judges. Instead, they prostituted themselves with other gods, bowing down to them. They quickly turned from the way of their ancestors who had walked in obedience to the Lord's commands. They did not do as their ancestors did. Whenever the Lord raised up a judge for the Israelites, the Lord was with him and saved the people from the power of their enemies while the judge was still alive. The Lord was moved to pity. Why, why would God do this? Why? Because he was moved to pity, slow to anger, long-suffering, abounding in love. Whenever they groaned because of those who were oppressing and afflicting them. However, whenever the judge died, the Israelites would act even more corruptly than their ancestors. Again, forgetfulness leads to unfaithfulness. Following other gods to serve them and bow in worship to them. They did not turn from their evil practices or their obstinate ways. That this, this is the pattern of judges. That they're obedient then they turn away from God. Partial disobedience leads to complete devastation. They worship idols. They're now enslaved to those idols. Things get so bad, they come to their senses. They cry out to God. God raises up a judge because his hand of mercy stretches out to them. And then they live in blessing and then they forget. One of our prayers should be that we should never forget. You should never forget. We just sang it. May I never lose the wonder. Don't forget. The Lord's anger burned against Israel and he declared, because this nation has violated my covenant that I made with their ancestors and disobeyed me, I will no longer drive them out before them, any of the nations Joshua left when he died. Verse 22 talks about how God tests Israel. And I want to go there, but for the sake of time, let me go somewhere else. And I'll close with this, and I'm going to ask the band to come up. We'll, we'll talk about this test next week. It just, just ran out of time. Um, but but I, I read this word covenant, and I think it's an important word. We, we see it in Judges chapter 2 where God, the angel of the Lord, God speaks about this covenant, and then it comes up again here where he says, you have violated my covenant. God makes a lot of covenants with his people. He does a ton of covenants. But, but this one, I think, is a specific one. 
Because, because he's talking about a land, a land that he had promised them. That this doesn't just go back to Moses, but it goes all the way back to Abram. So Genesis chapter 12, God calls Abram and says, I want you to leave your family and your land, and I want you to go to this place that I'm going to take you. Right? And then some things happen in uh, the next few chapters. But then it's in chapter 15, Genesis chapter 15, where, where he repeats it again, and he says, listen, I've promised you this land, and I'm going to, t- I'm going to take your offspring there. This is where they are now. This promise made all the way back in Genesis chapter 15. And, and, then, and then he says, listen, but, but I need to give you a sign so that you remember, so that you know, Abraham, that I'm actually going to do this. And so he says to Abraham, I want you to go get five animals. I wish we had time to unpack them, but five animals, three of them. He says, I want you to cut in half, right, put them side by side, and let the blood flow in between. This is a, a, a practice. It became a practice of how people would, would, would institute a covenant because what would happen is, is then I, I would stand here, you would stand here, we'd take arms, and we'd walk through the blood. Yeah. And what we're saying is that if either one of us breaks this covenant, we will end up like this. Yeah. And so in Genesis chapter 15, God tells Abraham to do this. And then Abraham goes into a deep sleep. Uh, Many commentators say that that sleep uh, represents the sin that is over us and in us. But then he kind of wakes up a little bit and he's a bit foggy and he's, you know, maybe if I can get there quick enough. Let me read it. Genesis chapter 15. It says, when the sun had set and it was dark, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch appeared. Don't miss it, pointing to Exodus 13. A pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. It's all connected. Appeared and passed between the divided animals. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, I give this land to your offspring from the brook of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates River, and the land of all the knights, right? Canaanites, Perizzites, all of them, all the knights. He's like, what's happening here? God goes, you know what? You're so engulfed in your sin. I will sign this covenant, and I will also sign on your behalf. I have no plans of breaking this covenant, but you will. And so therefore, I will walk alone, and when you do, it's my blood that will flow here. This takes us to Jesus. If you're trying to figure out if there's any hope in the book of Judges, if there's any hope in our times, there is. Jesus walked it alone. And it's his blood that covers us. It's his blood that saves. It's his blood that sanctifies. It's his blood that heals. It's his blood that restores. It's his blood that reconciles. That is our hope in horrific times. We point one another, we remind one another of the covenant that God made and kept for his glory and for our joy. And so, Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the promises that we find in the scriptures, all of them yes and amen because of the finished work of Christ. We thank you for the blood. We thank you that it's your hand of mercy that that reaches out when we are in the pit. A pit that we have chosen to be in because of our disobedience. And so God, right now in this moment, I ask that for those who are there, as they hear of the good news of the gospel, that they would know that God, your hand is stretched out, that the invitation has been made and all they have to do in this moment is say yes, yes to you. That yes saves And then, God, I pray for those who have said yes, but, but we found ourselves 
wandering in the wilderness. Holy Spirit, would you bring us back to our Father? Mercy. A merciful God. We thank you. In Jesus' beautiful name we pray. Amen.